31st of March 1985, one of the most important dates in the history of wrestling when Vince gambled everything he had on a mixture of pomp and body slams, of spectacles and suplexes, of Mr. T and Hulk Hogan. So began the annual tradition of WWE building an annual supercar designed to cross the gap between wrestling and the cultural mainstream. Several things are well known about the first ever WrestleMania, that it had a huge roster of celebrities, that it was a huge risk, and that it was a huge success. But what about the little quirks you might not know about the grandest daddy of the granddaddy of them all. I'm Adam from WhatCulture.com and here are 10 fascinating facts about WrestleMania 1. Number 10, it was nearly called the Colossal Tussle. <laughs> F*** off. No, it wasn't. It really? Oh, all right. Over the previous year, MTV aired WWE specials with similarly whimsical titles such as The Brawl to End It All and The War to Settle the Score. Mania almost went the exact same way. Not only was the show nearly called Hulkamania, which would have got very difficult to market in 2015, but apparently six months prior to the event, a meeting was held to determine the name and Colossal Tussle won the hasty vote. Thankfully, McMahon saw sense and changed it to the now iconic WrestleMania. Six months later at Madison Square Garden, WWF promoted a match between Andre the Giant King Kong Bundy as the Colossal Jostle, so at least they gave something a f***ing awful name. Number 9, there was a house show the day before. If you pour through WWE's results as we do because we've never known a lover's kiss, you'll often find that the roster tends to be idle for 6 or 7 days before Wrestlemania. These days they work raw at the latest and are given time off to rest up during Mania week. In the pre-raw era, they'd finish up a house show loop the Sunday before and would be freed up for a whole week until the big day. Not so in 1985. On Saturday morning, March 30th, a host of performers journeyed to TBS Studios in Atlanta and did a TV taping of the likes of Ricky Steamboat, Brutus Beefcake, I Sheik, Nikolai Volkov, King Kong Bundy, Greg Valentine, and David San Martino all took part with WrestleMania announcer Gorilla Monsoon on the call. Working weekends, but man, you son of a bitch. Number eight, Hogan and T hosted SNL hours before. And speaking of workload, a lesser known fact about WrestleMania 1 is that it took place at 1 p.m. in the afternoon, New York time. As such, the call time for WrestleMania must have been exceptionally early, as McMahon would have wanted to ensure that everything went smoothly in that adorably insane way that he does. As part of the media blitz for the event, Hogan and Mr. T hosted the institutional Saturday night night live at 11.30 p.m. the previous night and were there for the curtain call at 1 a.m. Not only that, but traditionally the SNL host or host and the guest and the cast and the crew all go out and party at some New York night spot until the wee hours. Even if Hogan and Mr. T ditched that and were in bed with the lights out no later than 2 a.m., they must have been knackered rolling into the garden the next day. Number 7, Jesse Ventura was a bundle of nerves. By January 1985, the body had already transitioned from wrestler to color commentator, replacing retired bruiser Angelo Mosca on broadcasts of All-Star Wrestling. Nonetheless, the pressure of beaming out to a closed-circuit audience across America, where any of his flaws would be seen without the benefit of editing, apparently weighed heavy on Ventura's shoulders. It weighs heavy on mine, after all, without editors, I'm f***ing nothing. His fellow commentator, Gorilla Monsoon, claimed he had to hold Ventura up by the back of his gaudy tuxedo jacket when the pair kicked off the show, addressing the closed-circuit view. Of course, Ventura did just fine, and he and Monsoon soon settled into a fantastic dynamic to rival JR and King and Heenan and Monsoon as the greatest announced teams of all time. Number 6, Tito Santana's only televised win. It's an off-sighted stat, but one worth mentioning here. Tito Santana was a Sami Zayn of his time, banked on to deliver quality performances, but existing a level or two below the headline. As dependable as he was, Santana was given the first ever televised WrestleMania win, defeating the masked executioner. Hey, thanks, said Santana, for then going on to lose at seven straight wrestling. WrestleManias. The run culminated with a loss to an on-the-rise Shawn Michaels in 1992 when Santana was on the verge of his 39th birthday. I mean, at least Santana got to defeat Papa Shango in the dark match of WrestleMania 9, but oh god, please don't let the same thing happen to Sami Zayn. Number 5. ST Jones misses his cue. It was the longest 9 seconds in recorded history. Glorified enhancement talent Special Delivery Jones was to do the honours for the monstrous King Kong Bundy, and since Vince wanted WrestleMania to kick off with a big shock or two, he was booked to lose in 9 seconds, a record at the time. Of course, anyone who can count or owns a watch knows that the match was actually closer to 24 seconds. In later interviews, Bundy would say that Jones was at fault for the foul up, claiming Jones wouldn't go to the mat when he was supposed to, where Bundy could hit the finishing splash, and Bundy also added that Jones didn't like the idea of losing in a quickie, hinting that the botch was an intentional f*** you. Number 4, Ricky Steamboat debuted less than a month before. In early 1985, Ricky Steamboat parted ways with his longtime home territory of Jim Crockett promotions, reportedly after differences with creative head Dusty Rhodes. The dragon would quickly resurface in New York, the sort of earnest and lovable babyface that was crucial to helping Vince carve out his McManifest destiny. That is an excellent pun yourselves. Now, it's not too common for wrestlers to make it to the WrestleMania main show without a firmly rooted presence in the company, but Steamboat was certainly an exception. For his WWE debut, he took part in a set of Atlanta tapings dated March the 2nd, 1985, and then it was straight over to Mania, where he was given a quick win over Matt Bourne, who would later go on to become Doink the Clown. How about that? How about that little fact? 
Number three, Don Morocco was kept off the show. Numerous recognisable performers were admitted from the WrestleMania card for one reason or another, and perhaps none was more conspicuous than magnificent Don Morocco. The dry-witted powerhouse and two-time former Intercontinental Champion had returned from a hiatus of several months in early 1985, now managed by Mr. Fuji. He took up a full schedule again, so his absence from the maiden WrestleMania feels a little bit odd. Morocco would later claim in a shoot interview that he was being saved to work a series of WWF Championship bouts with Hulk Hogan post-Mania, which in fairness he did, but it's still a bizarre reason to keep him off the show where a dominant victory could have made him even more of a draw. Number two, Mr. T nearly walked out on the day. The problems between Mr. T and Rowdy Roddy Piper are common knowledge. Piper wasn't the only wrestler that resented having to work with an outsider, one that hadn't put in the miles that he had. Paul Orndorff has also stated his dislike of the TV star, and Brutus Beefcake would note in a 2015 interview that Hogan had to essentially babysit a mentally frazzled Mr. T, because on the day of the show, fearing that Piper and Orndorff would shoot on him, T reportedly wanted to cheese it. I really, really hope that Hogan had to drug Mr. T's milk in order to keep him around, and if you don't get that reference, you're an absolute piece of shit. Fortunately, the main event went smoothly, with Piper and Mr. T cooperating on a number of entertaining spots. And number one, McMahon openly told his wrestlers it was make or break. Indeed, WrestleMania was a life and death proposition, a high consequence gamble on the part of Mr. McMahon. He'd personally invested so much in the close circuit venture and the bold move to take a wrestling territory national that if the show had failed, so too would the World Wrestling Federation. Tito Santana claimed that McMahon openly admitted as much to the locker room, saying in a 2015 interview that Vince told his staff, we're either gonna make it or we're gonna go broke. But with 19,000 strong in the garden and more than 400,000 fans across the country that bought into the closed circuit airings, WrestleMania was a huge success and WWE would live to put on at least 32 more. Monday, March 6th, live from Newcastle and free on YouTube. Drew Galloway will defend his WCPW Championship against the aerial assassin Will Ospreay. The American Nightmare Cody Rhodes will defend his WCPW Internet Championship. WCPW proudly presents Exit Wounds. Monday, March 6th, 7.30, 2.30 Eastern. Tickets still available at WCPW.